Hello to the Chicos and the Chicas, welcome back to our next uh, video. Before I get started with our game and our analysis today, I have got a few um, housekeeping kind of announcements. I owe you an apology. Recently, YouTube has been uh, lagging a little bit in terms of uh, the tempo of releasing videos. Unfortunately, I'm doing it slower than I usually do. Um, the reason behind this is, is that um, there are basically three people behind the videos that you are watching on my channel. Me as the creator, um, I have got uh, someone who is actually editing and uploading my videos and then I have got a thumbnail artist and actually all the three of us got hit with life um, at the same time. And so we are really, really struggling at the moment. My thumbnail artist is going through various uh, problems, which means that he can't do his uh, art, his thumbnails at all. My video editor guy is out of internet for the past two weeks and probably the foreseeable two, three weeks as well. So that's a disaster. And I myself am snowed under with an insane amount of work, in particular a deadline that I must meet. And so content has been halted or at least slow down dramatically once again i apologize for this i'm trying to do my very best to catch up and be back with the usual um three or four videos a week is a week is what we are aiming for uh the other thing i would like to say which is another community announcement is the fact that um hikaru uh has done another shout out to my channel which was the second one within a short period of time and um there is hardly any platform really where uh, I could thank him so that uh, the message would get to him and I don't think that this one will but this is uh, the best I can do um, to publicly thank him for his kindness. He has said a lot of very nice things about my channel and um, I think that the part of the reason why uh, there was a little spike in my subscription number again is partly um, those shout outs. So thank you very much Hikaru. And now uh, let's dive into this awesome game I have got today for you, Portish the Firmian. And um, almost always when I uh, um, present to you a No Die Classics, I usually like to embed it in some kind of chess learning or some chess concept that the classic game allows you to um, sort of better understand and model for you. This time, however, I think that there is a very curious lesson to be learned from this particular game and it is more on the psychological side and more on the gamemanship, if you will. So um, yeah, I, I think that this is quite curious. Let me tell you what exactly I'm talking about. This game was played in the very late 80s, I think 1989 uh, or even 1990, um, which obviously was towards the... Uh, tail end of uh, Lajos Portish's uh, career, he was definitely a fearsome customer uh, in the 70s predominantly and then in the 80s as well, but definitely by the 90s um, he was not the powerhouse he used to be beforehand, fourth in the world was his highest ranking. And so I think that Black in this game was committing two big mistakes. One of them was that he thought that his opponent was already on a downward trend in his chess career and therefore he could afford a little bit more than what he would normally do. And two, and this is another very interesting thing for me to observe and see how it plays out on the chessboard. Uh, Portish was mostly known for being a hardcore classicist in terms of chess and um, probably a better way to put it is a positionally very, very sound player with immense opening knowledge, very solid, very sturdy, incredibly difficult to beat. However, if there was one thing that was very rarely said about Portish during his career, that would have been that he was not a, a ferocious attacker, a wild guy who would throw everything at you to score a checkmate. That was not how he was perceived ever. And that's okay, there are lots of players who are not perceived like that. And despite of the fact that they were not perceived like that, they went all the way. Like Karpov is a Kramnik even, is a good example for this. Anyway, so where I'm going with this is that very often when you play an opponent who you put in a box, like I know this guy, I have seen him play, I have uh, played him in fact multiple times before. He's a positional player. We sometimes tend to underestimate their ability 
in other aspects of the game. And I do think that this is exactly what happened here with uh, Nick the Firmian, the um, American Grandmaster who is playing this game as black. So Portish with white. D4, Knight F6, C4, E6, Knight F3, B6, Queen's uh, Indian defense and a loud fawn that shouldn't talk to me. Um, Bishop B7, Bishop D3. So with a topsy-turvy move order we are actually going into some kind of a um i don't even know what to call it some weird tarash probably is the closest um we will get and um, this line has been considered to be not really great because of this capture on d5 and after pawn takes this knight e5 bishop check is actually quite uh, annoying or rather bishop check first and then knight e5 whereas if the knight takes again the check is quite pesky uh, or even we can take first. Anyway, I don't want to go into the opening too much because the structure is what is going to be very interesting here. Portage plays b3, castles, bishop b2, knight c6, rook e1, rook c, rook c. You know, just, if you are black, you go like, yeah, 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 yadi da di da da. He's putting all these pieces on good squares and then it's going to be some kind of a positional battle. And so the Fermian takes on d4 and then he's very clearly gearing up for either a hanging pawn or an isolated pawn structure, depending on how Portish takes back once he takes t4. He plays rook e8, thinking that cd is not on the cards, because in an isolated pawn structure, the bishop on b2 is just horrid. And that's exactly how I would think about it. If I were black and someone told me that your opponent is about to take here, I would be like, pfft, good luck. And this is exactly, and I'm not saying that the Firmian did that, I don't know, but I think there is a very solid chance that the combination of the things I told you before, the underestimating, the attacking prowess, the guessing too much into the opponent's style, and the third factor that he is no longer what he used to be, I think made the Firmian careless. Because what is the story here is actually quite interesting. After takes, night takes, night takes, if we take back with the pawn, then I suppose it's a slightly better position for white um, just because this bishop is more uh, active than this. And also this knight is a touch better than that because it's not blocking uh, anything, whereas this one is, can be pinned slightly better. But obviously everyone knew that queen takes d5 was coming. And on a cursory glance, it looks horrid for white because of this bishop is biting into his own isolated pawn. But Nana, you are allowed to calculate deeper than one move, remember? I made a video about this concept and this is definitely one that we should listen to. Bishop e4, baby, because there is another rule about isolated pawns and that is, is that they need to be blockaded. And that one is no longer blockaded whoopsie daisies now i think at this point the firmia must have thought that hmm this is not pretty brother and so i think somewhat carelessly he went back to d7 queen h5 was the better move allowing d5 and here i couldn't actually find a clear advantage for white but what i could find was a hugely enterprising idea if you know me from stream and whatnot you know that Queen sacrifices are my soft spot. And baby, take, 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 bishop back, c7. According to the engine, it's dead even. Let me tell you one thing. You would not want to play this as black. It's no fun. But this is what Nick the Fremian should have done. Instead, he went queen d7. Again, I suppose... His idea must have been to do something like a knight move, probably to b4. Uh, although knight e5 seems to be hitting that real hard. So I don't even know what vision he had here. I think it just fell apart here under this unexpected bishop e4 or the trade followed by bishop e4 idea. But long story short, boomski baby! Rook takes c6. And if you think that, oh yeah, whatever, knight e5 and then it's a piece of cake, everyone saw that. Mmm... Not quite. So, bishop had to take. Uh, rook takes his, uh, his 95 and similar stories to what happened in the game will happen. So I'm not going to spoil it. Bishop takes 95, queen b7. And now we realize that if we take here, rook takes queen f3. Um, I guess I can just go rook c8 and um, happy days. 
But this was not the plan, ladies and gentlemen. The plan here, and this is where tactical pattern recognition kicks in like there was no tomorrow. As soon as you see this and this, your eye is immediately drawn that direction, right up there to the king side. So when they go here, you don't look here. It doesn't matter how many guys are attacking this because in the end of the day, that dude is your target. And so you instantly pick up on this pattern. And that immediately gives you, at the very least, at the absolute least, a perpetual check. Not that we would go for it, because after King H7, Rookie free, uh, there is a cute little checkmate incoming here. And after Bishop G to D5 is a very, very subtle move. I dare say Rook G3 probably wins here too. Here Bishop F6 and then I'm still kicking D5. Queen D5 check here. What the heck is going on here? And now Rook G3. Okay, so bishop f6 gets taken, and if bishop f8, oh boy, knight g4, mate. Wow. So much for a positional player who is not going to try to attack me, huh? I didn't even see this when I uh, started recording or before the recording. I actually didn't go into this line at all. Because what happened was that after bishop takes... The Fermian went King H8, trying to avoid this cluster disaster, but boy, if you have ever seen a textbook example of out of the frying pan into the fire, behold the ultimate example. Check this out, baby. Queen H5, mate threat. G6 is uh, nicely met by mate in one. So he goes Bishop B4. He thinks, oh, defend, attack. Portish goes, excuse me? <laughs> Attack? You, me? No, 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 no. You are not attacking anybody, son. It's you who is getting attacked. Bishop takes e1, beautifully loses to this check, followed by mate. Whoops. And so now it's trouble time. Major, major trouble time. He plays g6. Potentially, bishop d5 was best when absolutely breathtaking tactical ideas come to the fore, such as bishop a6. Which, by the way, brings the Alekhainian concept to the fore, which is that we are playing chess across the whole board. What a fabulous concept, man. Really, really nice. So, um, the Firmian plays g6 instead. Queen check, king e7, and here comes another absolute banger, man. Like, I so love this game. It is just beauty on top of beauty. Look at this, d5. And the idea is to come back check and LPDO, as another great John Nunn told us. Loose pieces drop off. You need to see this, that this bishop is loose in order to recognize this amazing pattern. And so the Firmian went like, okay, I might as well gobble up everything on the way. And he did, and he got punished beautifully. Check. Check. Very important check to force the king onto this really, really bad square, so that when we take on c6, the queen is essentially buried alive. It's just amazing that Portis just kept on throwing in pieces after piece after rook, and he's just easily winning. Queen a8, and he casually just slides in the queen to f6. Like, not even a check, not even a capture. Just humbly allow me... To take this and uh, destroy you. Whoops. So queen f7, king here and then bishop d6 mate is the threat. So b5 was played so that queen f7 could be met by queen b king b6. Surprise, surprise. He just casually goes like, nah, you, you don't want to go there, brother. Not today. Not today. Goes rook d8, chook, king back. And... Oops! Another surprise. Check Arena incoming from here. This is true sadism. Like, it's just a, an ultimate example of superb domination. I mean, imagine you get mated like this. Check and mate. I c the reason enough to quit playing chess, right? And actually what happened to him is also quite filthy. He plays a6 and then check this out. 
Chickarino, baby. Thanks for coming on your bike. Wow. What a game. King b8, bishop d6 mate. If rook takes queen, then takes, and then I have got another queen. And all of a sudden, I'm 75 pieces up as white. And so the Firmian resigned. An absolutely breathtaking game of chess. I really highly recommend you to go through uh, the attack and the attacking potential basically from here. I think it's well worth analyzing because this is a very, very typical mating pattern or rather an attacking pattern. But it does take a fair bit of calculation and time to actually figure out how uh, the exact lines work. And so it's a great exercise to improve tactical skills, calculating skills and the likes. So on that note, I hope you guys uh, like this video. Like I said, please uh, be patient with me for the next few weeks. It's going to be a rough ride, but I'm trying my best uh, to be back on track as soon as possible. So thanks for hanging out there with me and thank you for tuning in. I hope to be back with more as soon as possible. Thank you. Bye.